Okay, well, good evening, everyone. I think we'll get started. I just see people are, are drifting in now. Uh, welcome back to the Canadian Concussion Center's webinar series, which is sponsored by LIUNA, the Laborers International Union of North America. My name is Leslie Rattan, and I'm pleased to be moderating our webinar series, uh, which has been developed for people with concussion, with persisting symptoms of concussion, their caregivers and healthcare providers. And if you've been with us before, you know that our sessions are focusing on a really wide range of post-concussive symptoms and, and issues. And we uh, have expert speakers who are with us uh, doing presentations for the initial half. And then uh, you're, we ha you have the opportunity to ask your questions uh, and get those answered during the second half. Uh, for those of you that are new, the sessions are recurring every other week on Tuesday evenings between 6 and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So tonight is actually our 23rd session. And if you have missed any of our previous ones, you can find those on the Canadian Concussion Center's website. Um, for this evening, if you do have any questions, if you look to the bottom of your screen on the, um, the right hand uh, side, you'll see a Q&A. So if you have any questions, please enter it into there and those will be answered uh, towards the second uh, half of, of tonight's uh, session. If you're having any technical issues, please enter those issues into the chat and, uh, and someone will be um, happy to help you out with that. Uh, we're also just going to run a short poll. It's uh, helpful for us to know who we actually have in the audience. So it should pop up on your screen now. If you can just indicate which group you fall within, this is just helping us to better understand um, who, uh, who is attending. Okay. And so for this evening's session, I'm really pleased to introduce, we actually have two speakers tonight. Uh, we have Stephanie Cowell and Dr. Firas Al-Rawi um, that will be presenting pre prevention of subsequent um, concussions. So we're gonna hear a lot about prevention. So Stephanie uh, has spent more than a decade working in injury and trauma prevention. She's the Director of Knowledge Translation at Parachute a national charity focused on preventing serious and fatal injuries. Stephanie leads Parachute's national projects to improve concussion prevention, recognition, and management across Canada, including the publication of the first ever Canadian guideline on concussion in sport. She's a member of the Federal Provincial Territorial Workgroup on Concussion in Sport and the Knowledge Translation Coordinator for the Canadian Concussion Network. And Dr. Al Rawi, who we're also going to hear uh, after Stephanie speaks, is an emergency medicine and sports medicine specialist at the University Health Network in Toronto. He's the medical director of the Occupational Health Assessment Program at Altum Health. He's also a clinician teacher and assistant professor at the University of Toronto. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie. Thank you, Leslie, for the welcome and welcome everybody to, yes, an evening focus on concussion prevention. Uh, so I work with an organization named Parachute. We are Canada's national charity dedicated to preventing serious and fatal injuries. And our vision for this country is one where we can all live long lives to the fullest. Uh, we have a few priority areas within uh, the wide array of injuries that, that do affect Canadians and concussion is one of those priorities. When we talk about injury prevention and we apply public health thinking to the issue, there are different levels of prevention we can focus on. Uh, we want to prevent injuries, particularly serious injuries, from happening in the first place. Uh, that's the ideal, and that's known as primary prevention. Uh, but when and if injuries do happen, there are still things we can do to reduce the severity of injury, the effects they have on people in their lives, and to support people uh, for the best possible health outcomes. Uh, so examples here include uh, first response and first aid, getting people prompt medical attention and appropriate assessment and also appropriate management during recovery. 
So our session tonight will focus on both of these areas. I will start by focusing on primary prevention, preventing confessions from happening in the first place. And then Faraz will speak more to the secondary and tertiary aspects of prevention. So here we go. Uh, when we uh, want to approach a, a health issue and, and preventing it, we need to start by understanding the issue. What is it? Who is it happening to? And how is it happening? Uh, so our starting point is the fact that concussions are the most common form of traumatic brain injury sustained in Canada. And if you look at the chart on the screen, hopefully you can see it clearly. Uh, th this shows the proportion that concussions make uh, take up out of all traumatic brain injuries that are seen in hospitals. Uh, so if you see the more colorful lines, the purple and green lines, uh, these show emergency department visits. And across different causes of brain injury, uh, and you know, assault, the sport and recreation, falls, we're seeing uh, concussions making up 50, 60, 70, over 90% of emergency department visits for brain injury. Now, hospitalizations for concussion are less common, but you'll still see in some cases, such as sport and recreation, concussions do represent you know, 30 to 40% of of brain injuries that are sustained in our country. Now, context is important when we're thinking about prevention. How are these injuries happen, happening? And uh, the, the rankings that I'm showing here are pulled from the Public Health Agency of Canada's report on TBI across the lifespan. And these, these are focused specifically on their data on concussion. And, and this is focused over a number of years. So we're seeing trends here. And concussions seen in emergency department visits are typically due to sport and recreation or falls. These numbers are, are very close in terms of annual averages and the concussions that they cause. Uh, but then also uh, people being struck by objects or other people outside of sport. So if we think about things like uh, getting hit in the head with an object, uh, perhaps hitting your head on a cupboard or uh, getting up under a table or desk, those are the kinds of things that fall into that struck by category. Uh, and finally, transport. So uh, motor vehicle collisions, whether you're a vehicle occupant, a pedestrian, a cyclist, or other road user, that's another major driver of concussion seen in Canadian emergency departments. With hospitalization, the list is fairly similar. Again, we're seeing falls in sport and recreation as major causes, transport, uh, but then we also see in hospitalized cases, so cases where potentially the person might have multiple injuries in, in addition to a concussion, we're seeing assault as a, as a major cause as well. Now, this is looking at, you know, Canada as a whole at the general population level. So that waters down a little bit. Some of the differences we can think about if we think about demographic characteristics of people sustaining concussions. So if we think about gender or sex or age group, things like that. Um, so, for example, with age group, youngest children, children under five and older adults, they are you know, far and away more likely to sustain a concussion from a fall. Whereas we see a, a concentration in our youth age group 10 to 19 of sport and recreation injuries. So thinking about concussions happen, we also want to think about sort of the biomechanics about how this occurs. And I'm going to play a little animation and hopefully if, if um, this type of due to your personal experience, if this type of head movement maybe bothers you, uh, maybe uh, I'm gonna play an animation that shows brain movement just to give you a little bit of a heads up. Uh, and so this is really uh, an animation to show um, the way that impact creates motion in the brain and, or sorry, motion of the brain within the skull that's going to cause a concussion. Uh, and it's really important to remember also that this force generated on the brain doesn't have to be a direct hit to the head. It can come from a hit to the body that's, that's propelling and transmitting that force to the brain. Uh, now, ideally, if we wanted to prevent concussions, that would involve kind of holding that brain still in the head. And, and that's not something that we can do. So when we're thinking about prevention, uh, we actually have to focus on preventing the type of incidents or events that can cause concussion. So causing those things I mentioned on the previous slide, like preventing falls, motor vehicle collisions, uh, reducing head impacts and other incidents in sport and recreation. 
And a little bit of this is what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to dive into a few examples over the next couple of minutes. Uh, I, I first, before going into some examples of how we can prevent, you know, I mentioned, um, you know, we can't hold the brain still. Another thing we don't have right now is any type of consumer product that you can buy that is proven to prevent concussions. And unfortunately, there are lots of claims out there as concussions have become more high profile, it becomes appealing to late put concussion on products or in headlines. Uh, so when we th see things like halo headbands, uh, head impact sensor, sensors, uh, baseline testing, there's all sorts of products and services that uh, get marketed as concussion prevention. And when we look at the evidence, we just don't have products that are proven to prevent concussions at this time. And so it's important that we're aware of that uh, because, um, you know, when we're focused on keeping ourselves, our children, our families safe, uh, you know, we, we want to find things that work and find things that will help us. And unfortunately, sometimes claims are out there that are not backed by evidence. So as I said, I'll dive into a few examples, uh, beginning with preventing falls, as I mentioned, is a, a leading cause of concussion in Canada. Uh, and in terms of young children, uh, you know, if you think about child, if you've been around children, particularly, you know, toddlers, they're in that exploration phase. Uh, physiologically, they're also top heavy because the proportion of their head to their body is different than adults. So children actually fall all the time as they're learning to walk and explore. Uh, but what concerns us in terms of injuries and particularly head injuries are falls from heights for children. And this really commonly happens on stairs, off of furniture, and more seriously sometimes uh, from windows and balconies. So uh, if you have children in your home, if you're a caregiver at any point for young children, uh, thinking about the ways that we can create a safer environment to prevent head injuries, in particular, uh, safety gates at the top and bottom of stairways, uh, buckling children into high chairs and strollers so they're not falling out, and using a simple equipment like window guards and balcony locks uh, to keep children from, from getting outside and, and uh, falling from a height. Uh, uh, fall prevention is also a significant health issue with older adults, um, and this gets a little bit more complex, but there are, are many different points of intervention we can do to, to prevent injurious falls with older adults. Again, the home environment is important. So, uh, you know, supportive handrails uh, on stairs, grab bars in, in bathrooms, which are another common site of falls. We live in a cold climate and ice and snow are a significant cause of falls. Um, in the Canadian Community Health Survey, older adults reported slips on ice as one of the major causes of a fall they've had in the last year. So paying attention to, to um, making our areas safer on our stairs and our walkways outside. Uh, strength and balance training as, as we age to, to maintain our ability to uh, you know, have a proper gait, but then also recover should we slip is really important. And overall management of our health as we age, particularly um, chronic conditions and diseases, uh, and also paying attention to medications. Uh, medications in particular that we take as we age may cause dizziness and, ba dizziness and balance issues. And so this is something that we can raise with, with our pharmacists and physicians. Similarly, I just wanted to highlight a few key aspects of uh, motor vehicle collisions. Again, another leading cause of concussions and other brain injuries. And uh, there are, if we look at the data um, over the last you know, many decades, the major contributing factors to incidents on our roads that cause injury have not have not changed. Uh, you know, the most recent may be the emergence of distracted driving, but even that is you know a couple of decades now. Uh, so things like speeding, impaired driving by both alcohol and uh, su other substances, including cannabis, and then as I mentioned, distracted driving are major things to pay attention to in terms of safe navigation of our roads. Speed in particular, um, you know. Uh, higher speed is associated not, not only with an increased likelihood of crashing, but also increased severity in the outcome uh, for vehicle occupants, for drivers, as well as for pedestrians and cyclists. If we lower our speeds, 
uh, it really helps to prevent serious and fatal injuries. Um, and of course, uh, in our vehicles as occupants for, for adults and children, making sure we're wearing proper restraints. This may not always uh, prevent if there's going to be a whiplash motion that could cause concussion, but um, you know, reducing the effects of a crash through proper equipment is important. I'm going to uh, say a few bits about uh, sport concussion. This of course gets a lot of focus in the literature. So I have a few points to speak to. Uh, as a starting point, when we think about concussion, particularly in sport, we like to jump to, or we're used to jumping to thinking about protective equipment. Uh, but we need to emphasize that helmets are an important piece of equipment for many activities. They can prevent serious catastrophic head injuries, so we don't wanna diminish their importance. But we do need to continue to emphasize that they are not proven to prevent concussions. So slapping a helmet on isn't the answer to uh, preventing concussions and reducing their consequences. Other aspects of equipment have been explored in sport for potential um, concussion prevention. Other forms of headgear have been looked at in soccer and rugby, uh, but the literature still has not uh, shown, uh, you know, clear recommendations for or against these in terms of concussion prevention. Uh, mouth guards, similar to helmets, are an important piece of equipment. They do prevent teeth and mouth injuries. And this isn't, you know, that in and of itself uh, is a great reason to, for many athletes to wear one during activities. Uh, these have been studied for a while. There's been sort of back and forth uh, results from the literature on mouth guards for concussion prevention. To this point, the evidence suggests uh, they may be associated with lower odds of concussion. So uh, trending in a positive direction. But we, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the, these results around, around equipment are either inconclusive or maybe not proven. So we want to think about, you know, injury prevention and concussion prevention in a broader, more comprehensive way. So, um, you know, as we're encouraging particularly young people, but then also people throughout their life course to stay active, uh, how are we thinking about creating positive environments, both in terms of the participation experience and then physical and mental safety. So thinking about assessing uh, the environment, the, the, the playing surface, the field, the ice, the equipment that's being used, assessing these for hazards and making changes as needed. Uh, developing um, ourselves and if we're coaching others or teaching others uh, through appropriate skill development, uh, depending on the sport or activity. Um, maintaining a controlled game or activity environment. Uh, this is a particular role for coaches and officials who, who can help control emotions, help enforce rules, particularly rules that uh, are meant to keep players safe from injury, such as hits to the head, fighting, things like that. And of course, overall thinking about team, league, and broader sport culture that, uh, again, we are reinforcing respect for each other, that we are avoiding intent to injure, that we are avoiding head impacts. And also when we start to think about secondary prevention, that we're encouraging an open environment where uh, incidents and concussion signs and symptoms are reported and respected and, and athletes are supported for to prioritize their well-being. The final note I'll say about uh, prevention of concussion in sport is that the strongest evidence we have in the literature is about changes to sport policies. And so uh, as an example, um, you know, the most studied policy change in the literature has been the elimination of body checking in youth ice hockey for those under the age of 13. And this change was implemented by Hockey Canada about nine years ago now. And evidence studying this policy change um, has shown it leads to a 67% reduced risk of concussion. And these are the types of policy changes we're seeing being examined across sport organizations and we need to continue to study uh, because these go beyond the individual and have a high impact level across sport. Finally, before I hand it off to Firaz to talk more about other aspects of prevention, uh, I do want to emphasize why prevention matters. Uh, you know, in the acute phase, there is immediate impact and effect on individuals 
uh, and you know their identity, their engagement of everyday life. And we are also you know beginning to understand more about people living with long-lasting symptoms, uh, potential cumulative effects, and also even studying subconcussive impacts and their potential impacts on the human body. Uh, so there are many reasons to want to prevent concussions in the first place, and then also do what we can to support optimal recovery. Uh, so thank you for your time on this aspect. Now I will hand the floor over to Faraz. Hey, thank you, Stephanie. Um, tough act to follow. Uh, I will do my best. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to uh, talk about, uh, uh, and thank you, uh, Dr. Ratan, for the introduction, and thank you for having me on this webinar. Um, I will not have, uh, I won't be able to view the question box. I know that there'll be a question and answer session at the end. Uh, so if you do have any questions, please uh, save them and we'll try to get through these uh, slides. And what I've tried to do is try to give you a practical approach about um, concussion prevention. Uh, I don't have any disclosures uh, to this talk and it's basically, um, uh, I'm going to share some thoughts um, from my work in both in the emergency department, but also at the sports medicine clinic. I have the privilege of being able to, to work with um, patients when they first get injured, but also have the uh, privilege of seeing them in follow-up uh, when they have, if they have their concussions and try to help guide management. So as Stephanie mentioned, the definitions of uh, prevention, primary prevention, is preventing it before it occur, condition before it occurs. Secondary prevention is uh, after the injury occurs, is trying to minimize the effect of the uh, injury or the condition. And tertiary prevention uh, aims basically at uh, reducing the long-term consequences of chronic diseases. And this, does, this is not specific to concussions. This is across the board of public health. Um, conditions like cancer, you'll see a lot of evidence in the literature about cancer um, and other chronic conditions, uh, how uh, prevention works to try to minimize the uh, uh, outcomes, uh, the uh, bad outcomes. If we want to bring it uh, towards concussions, uh, so uh, I'd like to give you an example uh, of uh, an athlete. An athlete. So Joey is an important player on the rugby team. They had a good, sorry, the screen is in the way. They had good concussion education prior to playing. They had trained very well. They did a good uh, pregame warm up. They wore their personal protective equipment and then they played uh, within the, the plan that was provided to them. Uh, and this uh, is the uh, role of primary prevention. Joey was unfortunately injured while playing. Uh, they sustained a hard hit to the head. They were knocked out for a few seconds. The coach and the medical team immediately noticed what happened. They assessed Joey. Uh, they suspected they had a concussion and Joey was taken off the field and placed in concussion protocol. This is the role of secondary prevention. Six weeks after the injury, Joey still has persistent post-concussive symptoms. Joey is working with a multidisciplinary team to manage uh, symptoms to help recovery and return to sports and return to play. Sorry, return to school and return to play. Uh, and this is the uh, role of tertiary prevention. Um, primary prevention was already addressed very well by Stephanie. So um, we'll talk about the, uh, the points in secondary prevention, and how this worked out for Joey. So, uh, so Joey was uh, hit hard to the head and was knocked out for seconds. The mechanism of injury that Joey sustained is highly suggestive of Joey sustaining a concussion based on what was seen on the field. The coach and the medical team assessed, assessed them immediately. They suspected that Joey had a concussion. They were well-educated. They were prepared, prepared to deal with an injury that the, that the player may sustain, and they knew what to do about it. Joey was taken off the field and placed in concussion protocol. Now, uh, you hear it, you, you may hear this uh, all the time on, on uh, with the elite teams when a player is placed in concussion protocol. What that, what does that, what that, what does that exactly mean? Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Now, the team had a plan to address the concussion when it occurred. The team was aware of the consequences of the concussion. Uh, 
uh, Stephanie mentioned the, uh, uh, the multiple impacts, but also the second impact syndrome uh, are consequences of concussion. If they are not um, addressed at the time, then there's a likelihood that this concussion, if it were a, a minor or a mild, uh, milder concussion, uh, there's a potential for it to become quite devastating if uh, proper plans are not, uh, not uh, uh, taken at the time. So it sounds pretty simple, right? Um, it sounds, you know, somebody, you see someone, they have a concussion, you take them off the field, uh, you place them in concussion protocol, and it seems pretty straightforward. Um, I mean, it, it, I wish it was smooth all the time, but there are things I'm just going to be devil's advocate and throw in some things that could uh, throw you awry and make things go wrong uh, in a way. So what if, for example, the coach didn't see how the injury occurred? What if they did not, they weren't um, uh, privy to how the mechanism of injury occurred? Uh, would that make a difference? Of course, I mean, the, the whole, as you, as we've talked about, the whole idea of, uh, of diagnosing a concussion largely depends on the mechanism of injury and that what happens after. What if Joey didn't hit their head? So, as Stephanie mentioned, you don't really have to hit your head to have a concussion. Uh, not every hit to the head will cause a concussion, but not every concussion is caused by a hit to the head, as a wise man once said. Joey, what if, what if Joey said, when the coach went to assess them, what if Joey said they felt fine and they wanted to keep playing? What, what, what then? What, what if Joey said, I don't have any symptoms, I want to continue to play? What if Joey felt that, sorry, what if the coach felt that Joey was too important for the team to be taken off the field? Joey is an important player. This is probably the finals. And if Joey gets off, comes off the field and they're like maybe one point down, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a potential that the team could lose. What if there were only five minutes left to the game? I mean, why don't we just let Joey continue to play? What's the worst that can happen? And then what if Joey, in addition to sustaining the, the concussion, what if Joey also dislocated their shoulder? So a lot of things can murk up the water. It's not always uh, straightforward. So diagnosing a concussion on the field largely depends on, uh, on the clinical history provided. Uh, the things that, that can make you suspect that a person had a concussion are, uh, as per the concussion recognition tool, fifth edition, uh, if the if the player lies motionless for a while, if the if you see that the player is clutching their head, if you notice that they become unsteady on the field, if they if, you, if they appear to be uh, dazed or confused immediately after the impact, loss of consciousness is not always is not necessary for the diagnosis of a concussion. You don't have to lose consciousness to have a concussion, uh, to to be diagnosed as a concussion. Be, keeping in mind that symptoms may be delayed, so Joey might be telling the complete truth that Joey did not have any symptoms at the time of impact. They may have had a headache, they may have felt this, but many times these symptoms can be delayed. Symptoms can be delayed up to 24 to 48 hours, which makes diagnosing it a little bit harder. We sometimes see patients in the emergency department who've had an, an injury to their head. Uh, they don't have concussion symptoms, but we tell them that, you know, it's important to be mindful of your symptoms over the course of the next 24 hours. Your symptoms might, might show up a little bit later. Um, what um, concussion protocol basically means that the, the that you suspect a concussion, it's best to remove the, the player from the field of play. It's best for them to uh, be reassessed, and then if they feel if they if they are examined okay, if they feel okay, then you can reintegrate them back into the playing field. But do not take chances with somebody who's had a concussion. This is uh, secondary prevention. Um, Challenges to, to secondary prevention. There are, there are ob obstacles that we have to overcome for secondary prevention. So one of them is, is the availability of PPE. And while we know that the best PPE does not, does not prevent concussions, we do know that uh, they do prevent more severe injuries. Training and therapy are extremely important in terms of uh, minimizing the effect of concussions. There are many studies on, on um, pre-game pre um, training sessions that can help uh, prevent concussions by, by up to about 67%, like two thirds of concussions can be prevented in uh, certain teams. There was a good study about uh, rugby players where they used something called the Activate program uh, that minimized the occurrence of concussions by about two thirds. But these are not always available to everyone. Uh, we still see like, despite the widespread knowledge about concussions, we still see uh, a lack of knowledge about diagnosing it, what to do about them. Um, 
it's an I call it the invisible injury. You can't see it. It's something that you can't see. You're not wearing a, a sling. You're not in, in, in a cast. You can't see this. The other part is that not understanding the consequences of injury. And one of the things that that I see with uh, with athletes is, you know, they want to get back to play. They have they have the motivation to play. So sometimes they minimize their symptoms. They say, I don't have symptoms. I'm feeling fine. I feel I'm ready to go back to play. Uh, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't tell them that, you know, they're lying or they're feigning because they want to go back to play. But what I try to do to the athletes is I explain to them the consequences. I, say, I tell them, like, if you do have symptoms and you're not telling me about them, and if you do tend to injure your head, then there's a chance that your concussion can become triple fold uh, in terms of symptoms. You can have a second impact syndrome and second impact syndrome can sometimes can sometimes lead to that. So. It's, it's important to try to, to uh, um, explain the consequences to the athletes or to the injured person uh, who wants to get back into a contact uh, form of sport or a type of work that would uh, put them in, in danger of uh, getting injured again. Um, some people don't know that the symptom, symptom onset might be delayed. They, um, they, they come, they have uh, other injuries, uh, they... Uh, don't realize that their symptoms are going to be delayed. And then the motivators, the passive and the negative drivers, some people who will get injured at work, some uh, will have a negative um, feeling about going back to work because that's where they were injured. They might have a lot of psychological apprehension about getting back to work. The majority actually, the majority wants to go back to work and they want to go back to work safely. Some will be apprehensive about it. So those uh, uh, patients would experience uh, symptoms much more prominent than other than others who uh, than, than others. Athletes uh, tend to minimize their symptoms because they want to go to play, uh, get back to play. And then the big one is distracting injuries. Uh, I've actually heard some people complain that they came to an emergency department, they were in a car accident, they broke their leg, uh, or you know they had uh, like a distracting injury, at, such as the, the the shoulder dislocation that Joey sustained. Uh, the amount of pain that they had in their shoulder distracted from the actual um, uh, concussion. Uh, we treat the, the dislocated shoulder because we see it. We do not see the concussion. We give pain medications for the dislocated shoulder. That helps with the headaches that you could, you could, you could have when you have a concussion. So, so the visible injury uh, uh, supersedes the, the invisible injury. And then you don't notice that you've had the invisible injury until maybe days after because of the uh, effects of everything that um, had uh, happened before. Um, now, while we gave the example about um, uh, a sports-related injury, these injuries, as Stephanie mentioned, can happen. They could be work-related. They could be related to motor vehicle accidents. They could be recreational injuries. They could be everyday accidents. And the the challenges to secondary prevention apply to all of them. So lack of resources, uh, the pre-injury health, lack of knowledge of the invisible injury, um, the uh, negative and uh, positive reinforcers, uh, and then the, the available, the, the, the presence of distracting injuries and the delayed onset of symptoms. These apply to any type of, uh, of concussion, um, regardless of cause. I just gave uh, the example of a sports injury because that's what's close to mind. Secondary prevention is a team sport. Um, it's important for the uh, Person for the person who gets injured, because at the end of the day, they are they are the person who's going to be paying the most of the most price. It's important to try to be educated. Uh, Stephanie will be giving us some resources at the end of the talk today. It's important to self to self educate uh, in terms of um, uh, what your injury entails. Uh, be mindful that there's a lot of misinformation out there as well. So try to uh, to utilize the resources from the proper uh, proper uh, settings. You also have to have an advocate, and the advocate uh, could be uh, a coach. Uh, and the coach does not necessarily have to be the athlete. Uh, if we're talking about an athlete, it would it would be the coach, but it's also the school. It's your family. It's your workplace. Uh, a supportive workplace makes a huge difference. A case manager for your work-related injury, if they are supportive, it makes a huge difference. The insurance adjuster, again, if they are supportive, it makes a huge difference in terms of um, supporting you through the supporting the injured person through their uh, through their recovery and their prevention of the secondary injury. 
the healthcare system is also uh, a huge part of uh, the uh, secondary prevention. And as Stephanie mentioned, uh, the legislation is, is also paramount in secondary prevention. We have now clear laws about uh, being uh, educated, uh, educated about uh, injuries that be uh, in the field, uh, uh, players allowing to, uh, to play or to be removed from the field. Uh, there's uh, uh, very strict um, uh, rules about uh, who can and who, who should and who shouldn't play. So knowledge and education is paramount. Um, it's important to know what to do if you have a concussion. Uh, cognitive and physical rest, the current recommendations are you cognitive and physical rest or symptom limited rest for 24 to 48 hours, after which gradual resumption of activities as tolerated. Um, I still uh, have people who are told by their healthcare providers that they have to rest until their symptoms go away. This is not good. This is detrimental. People become deconditioned, they become withdrawn, uh, their senses become so um, uh, stimulated in a sense that is not good. So um, resting is, uh, 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 we realize that, you know, people with concussions have symptoms, but the best way to get better is to try to um, uh, get back into activities, not contact, but activities is tolerated. The vast majority of, of uh, patients with concussions, regardless of the cause, will improve within one to three months. In fact, some people are referred to me from the emergency department. By the time I see them in two to three weeks, uh, they either cancel or they come and, and let me know that their symptoms have actually uh, improved. Tertiary prevention is kind of the same. Uh, six weeks after the injury, Joey still has persistent post-concussive symptoms. Now, the difference with tertiary prevention is that this requires a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, it, um, it takes into account the, uh, the injured person's pre-injury health. It takes into account their symptoms. It takes into account what physical examination findings they have. Do they have problems with balance? Do they have uh, tightness in their neck? Do they have vision problems? Do they have um, uh, um, um, problems with um, uh, range of motion, problems with uh, coordination uh, between, their, between their legs and, and their eyes. Um, the pre-injury health also plays a huge part. We know that people with pre-existing mental health issues can have a much uh, larger increase in their symptom, uh, in their mental health uh, symptoms after a concussion. Um, it's important to address these. It's important to, uh, to address the symptoms. And then with the multidisciplinary team, uh, uh, managing the symptoms goes hand in hand with um, with um, uh, planning a return to sport, a return to school, uh, a return to work, um, because ultimately this is what um, uh, most um, people with concussions want. They want to get back to the life that they had prior to their injury. So emphasis should be made on improving the four aspects of concussions, which are the physical symptoms, the cognitive symptoms, the mood and the sleep. Uh, and improving core strength and endurance, and we talked about uh, the other things as well. Again, you can you can probably tell that if you, uh, one of the challenges that you have is not everybody has extended health benefits. Not everybody has um, support from uh, uh, their insurance company or their work or their work uh, um, uh, case manager. Um, so they won't have access to the care that, that they need. Uh, money becomes an issue. Uh, you have a concussion, uh, you're injured, you need treatment, you don't have an income because you can't go back, you can't go back to work. And if you can't go, go back to work, you don't make an income, you can't afford the treatment. So it just becomes uh, hard. Um, knowledge is paramount. It's really important to know what the injury is. You need to know what the uh, symptoms are and how to manage the symptoms. You need to know what the negative and positive drivers are and how to how to influence them. And associated inju injuries need to be uh, to be managed as well. If somebody's broken their leg, I really can't work on their balance uh, very well because they only have one leg to lean on. So things to, to keep in mind. Um, Joey uh, is now recovering uh, well with the hard work and the assistance of their uh, coach and their medical team. They are progressing as anticipated with their return to school and uh, return to play protocol. Joey really loves rugby, was really interested in going back, but this is their third concussion. And they have decided to engage in a different sport that they enjoy that involves less uh, contact. Um, I'm 
done uh, talking, so um, I'm going to leave you with the resources. I have one resource to give you. This article I found, it's one, one of the several references that I used in preparing today's talk. It's very well written, it's very simply written, and it has a very, very good um, um, uh, approach uh, to um, uh, concussion management and uh, in turn prevention. So um, it will be provided, uh, the link, I mean, the uh, it will be provided when, the, when you receive the slides. I'll hand it over to Stephanie uh, to tell you about her resources as well. Oh, what happened there? Okay, that didn't work. No problem, Faraz, I could do a quick switch back. Okay, I'm sorry, let me stop sharing. We thought we were gonna be smoother with this folks, but we will. Sorry, uh, that didn't work. That'll, no problem. Uh, so I had it already. <laughs> uh, what we wanted to do was just um, uh, share a couple of resources. Um, we always like to share where you can go for more information uh, since we have limited time today. Uh, so I wanted to share uh, Parachute's website, parachute.ca slash concussion, where we have lots of resources, general information, but also information for healthcare professionals, sport organizations, uh, schools and educators, um, and other professionals about concussion. We also have a free concussion ed app that you can download on any device um, that has more information about prevention, about return to activities, and also enables you to keep track of symptoms uh, during recovery. It's not a clinical app, but uh, can be used for a person's own information. Uh, and finally, I wanted to share a couple of great uh, evidence-based opportunities to access resources. First of all, the Concussion Awareness Training Tool, or CAT, has free uh, evidence-based and bilingual modules for, again, multiple audiences, healthcare professionals, educators, uh, young people, um, and also uh, a module focused on uh, those working with survivors of intimate partner violence. Um, and in that vein, I'd also like to point to the Abused and Brain Injured Toolkit, which focuses on resources for, uh, for many different stakeholders who may, um, uh, and survivors themselves, uh, in relation to intimate partner violence. Um, this is a very common but uh, often unaddressed cause of concussion and other head injuries. And so this wonderful toolkit is available with lots more information and really encourage you to pay attention, particularly if you are um, a clinical practitioner. Thanks very much. Great, thank you so much. Um, really two great presentations, Stephanie and um, Faraz, I apologize for, I realized I mispronounced your name. My apologies if you want, oh, you're back. Okay, excellent. So this is perfect. We have, it looks like we have a few questions. Uh, Lori is asking, what, what would you say is a good multidisciplinary concussion clinic to look for? Or what would you look for in, in one? Is that for me? Sure, if, yeah, if you wanna take that, that would be great. Okay. So a, a, a multidisciplinary clinic should involve uh, a physiotherapist uh, and or chiropractor. You should have an occupational therapist, but um, what you basically need is it has to be targeted towards what the person's symptoms are. Uh, if the main symptoms are um, uh, within the uh, domain of um, the Best, like vestibular symptoms, then there has to be somebody who knows how to do vestibular therapy. There is no, the, the, the problem with the, with the clinics is there's no one size fits all. You need to have somebody who's the maestro who, who, who uh, does the assessment, who identifies what the areas of, of um, deficiencies are and what needs to be worked on. Uh, it can be very hard to find uh, one service, uh, all of the services in one place. Um, but uh, many of the clinics who deal with concussions do have, if they, they don't have the um, resource available at their clinic, they would have resources elsewhere that they can, they can lead you to. But it has to be fashioned based on what your symptoms are. But at minimum, there has to be an occupational therapist, a physiotherapist, or a chiropractor. A kinesiologist would be a, a huge asset in terms of exercising and uh, psychotherapy support. 
Great, thank you. Yeah, and Lori had added, she, she said, I find there are so many different concussion clinics out there and many clinics lack the full spectrum of modalities for concussions. Which speaks to what Stephanie was saying is uh, there's, there's been a lot of like commercialization of concussions because people are desperate to get the help that they need. Um, so uh, it's really important to, and I'm not, you know, I'm not advertising any one clinic over the other. I mean, there's many, many great clinics out there, but what you basically need is, is what, what is fashioned to you. Great, thank you. Uh, it looks like we have one of your patients, uh, Dr. Dr. Ohawi, uh, it's April, a very grateful patient. Um, and she's asking, what safer sports do you recommend for those who are recovering from a concussion? Hi, April. Um, uh, glad to hear that, see that you're here. Um, so there's two aspects here. One of them is, is what do you enjoy doing? Uh, because you can't get into a sport that you don't enjoy. Uh, and then the second aspect is um, what, your, what are your restrictions? So you need to understand what your restrictions are uh, first. We generally recommend uh, non-impact sports. With that said, people who have recovered from their concussion, they can go back to contact sports if needed. Too many concussions, not a good idea to go back to contact sports. Uh, but you need to find what your passion is. Um, uh, swimming, cycling, um, uh, spinning uh, are good non-contact sports. Tennis, if you can avoid getting hit in the head by a tennis ball um, and you have good hand-eye coordination, this also uh, is also good. Um, Stephanie, do you have anything to recommend? Uh, no, I, I think you're right. I think part of it is, is finding um, what, what's enjoyable. And, you know, we often get the question about how many, how many concussions is too many. Um, and just, and I think to your point, Faraz, there, there's not a specific number. It's all about the individual and, and um, you know, what are you experiencing? What's your actual risk at this point? And what's the best decision for overall quality of life and risk moving forward? Great, thanks, Stephanie. Um, we have someone asking, does education really work in preventing concussions? Some experts only include rule changes as definite injury prevention results. I don't know, Stephanie, can you speak to that? Uh, sure, I can start and Faraz if you wanted to add anything to it. Um, so we've seen a lot of study of education uh, more so for secondary prevention. So a lot of focus on education in terms of uh, you know, quick response, appropriate response, recognize and removal. Um, and so, so that's a really important focus in terms of uh, preventing concussions from happening altogether. Um, what we're seeing more is looking at, at training, uh, particularly in, in the workplace and also in sport. Uh, so a, a number of sports in Canada are focusing on uh, the training aspect, particularly where there is intentional contact. So things like tackling and hits. Um, there's a component of let's delay those um, and not have young impressionable children exposed to those types of contact. And then as um, and then really studying uh, how to make that type of contact safer. Um, for as I don't know if you want to add additionally. Uh, no, I, I was going to say what you said. Um, it's uh, it's uh, important to get the the proper. Um, so the proper training uh, ahead of the, the sport itself, but also the importance of understanding your symptoms and what to do about them, uh, uh, especially after you've, su you've suffered a concussion, but yes. Great, thank you. Um, another question probably for both of you, we've got someone asking, why is Ontario the only province with concussion laws? Yeah, a number of factors. <laughs> uh, one, the, the complexity of, of legislation in Canada when things fall under provincial and territorial jurisdiction, uh, such as health and sport. Uh, you know, it, it has each jurisdiction typically has has to take an approach, um, and we have seen that the legislative approach taken in Ontario. There have been advocates um, who would like to see. Uh, legislation across the country and, and we haven't seen uh, uptake of that at this point. Some provinces and territories are electing to go a non-mandatory route and working through other systems they have in place such as their provincial sports systems. Um, I will point to the fact that uh, 
uh, Dr. Tatter and I believe it's John Moore just, just published a co-authored commentary on this fact, uh, speaking about uh, legislation across the country. So perhaps that's something that, that we could share. Um, but really it comes down to um, a little bit of uh, you know, what the approach is in each province and territory, what they've selected. Uh, we also had in Ontario, you know, the really strong advocacy of the story of Rowan Stringer and uh, Gordon Kathleen really wanting to create change and not have another family go through what they went through. Um, and then a, another champion like Dr. Tatter and others uh, like Eric Lindros, like Parachute and others come on board. So a really strong front was, was dedicated to to creating that law. Great, thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder to everyone out there, if you've got questions, please just put them into the Q&A. Um, and this is for Dr. al uh, This person indicates, I was hurled from a public vehicle from my seat to the floor and was told in the ER to avoid using computer screens, why? And then they also ask, can a clot form in a vertebral artery during this fall to the floor? Two excellent questions. Um, the, uh, to, to answer the first one uh, about avoiding screens, we generally recommend uh, uh, avoidance of screens for the first 24 to 48 hours because the visual symptoms can, um, can, can aggravate the, the vision, the screens can aggravate symptoms. Uh, with that said, it doesn't affect everybody. So, uh, which is why we, we recommend uh, relative rest for the first 24 to 48 hours. And we say symptom limited rest. And I tell my patients that if screens don't bother you, do screens, but in general, it's, it's best to avoid screens for 24 hours. And again, with the mindset that sometimes the symptoms can be delayed by 24 to 48 hours, so you may not have the symptoms immediately after the, um, the injury. And to answer the second question about the, uh, the clot in the vertebral artery, yes, it, it can happen, and, but it's usually not related to, this is not concussion related, this is related to the, to the way that your head moves. You can get something called a dissection of of an artery, and that would be like a vertebral, uh, it can happen either in the vertebral artery or the carotid artery, which, which runs in the front. These blood vessels run very close to the, to the spine, to the vertebrae, and a certain um, um, move, sudden movement to the neck can cause uh, uh, splitting of the lining of the, of the blood, blood vessel called the dissection. And that can cause, uh, that can sometimes lead to a stroke if not recognized. Uh, it can happen from uh, from being thrown from you know uh, uh, from an injury. It can sometimes we see it, and if there are some chiropractors in the group, they might not like me for saying this. We sometimes see it with neck manipulations at chiropractors in the emergency department. So uh, it's important. Uh, it's one of the um, complications of sudden movement to the neck, uh, a dissection to the to the artery. Great, thank you very much. Um... Will subsequent, oh, I knew there was something I wanted to say. Just for everyone, if you are looking for um, the slides for tonight, go to the chat. And Christian has very kindly, um, he's got links to a number of the, um, and some of the other resources. So go to the chat and you can find them there. Uh, question, will subsequent concussions have worse and longer lasting effects? Dr. al okay. either one of you can. <laughs> Simple answer is yes. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's known that um, the, uh, um, having a history of previous concussions does increase the risk of your subsequent concussions becoming more severe, which is why it's important that when you do have a concussion to rehab appropriately and uh, try to minimize the, um, uh, the, um, um, the, the, the uh, outcomes of subsequent concussions if you have them. Great, thank you. Uh, Dan has a comment. He says, clinics I have tried do not treat persistent ongoing symptoms. You have to be an acute patient. I wonder if either of you can comment on, on that. Second. Uh, I don't know if I have I have much to add other than I, I you know I know that we have heard that there are significant gaps in in you know the services available um, across the country. Um, for as I don't know if you have more to say on that. I mean, there are. It, it just depends where, where you're looking. There are. Um, I mean, typically uh, as sports sports um, 
sports related concussions we deal with the acute injuries you are you are correct there are some neurology based clinics who who are run by neurologists that have um, uh, better experience in managing chronic concussions uh, um, uh, uh, yes, uh, neurology based i don't want to a- advertise or um, give names to anyone out there but there are some uh, neurology based clinics who deal with chronic concussions because then it becomes the question of managing the chronic migraines it becomes the questions of uh, of involving a neuropsychologist or neuropsychiatrist in the care of patients which is not something that is immediately available to sports uh, sports uh, clinics great thank you um we've got someone indi- michelle indicate she's had 21 concussions why is concussion treatment not covered by ohip my balance is horrible and i can't afford to pay for concussion treatment and testing this is causing secondary concussions vote ndp the elections are coming up soon, so um, I agree. I, I agree. Uh, the The cost of uh, of lost uh, lost income, the cost of lost lost workers, the cost of, and you, you saw when I spoke about the tertiary prevention, uh, the, the cost that the system is is uh, is um, paying for uh, losing active people uh, in uh, in the market is is uh, astronomical. Um, if the government would cover these, um, um, the, you know, the um, extended, uh, instead of having to rely on extended health benefits, if this was covered by the government, I think the, uh, the re- returns would be much better. Um, yeah, speak with your MPP and uh, vote wisely. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna combine, we've got a couple of questions about uh, persisting cognitive symptoms post-concussion. Do you have any suggestions or strategies to improve cognitive abilities? Um, yeah, and, and kind of where do we look for this, basically? Um, Stephanie, do you want to do that? Get that or do you want me to? Okay, so um, uh, usually an occupational therapist would be the best, better, uh, the better uh, resource to have. Uh, it's also, uh, I mean, the gold standard of testing for cognitive dif- the difficulties. And I think there was uh, um, a question as, as well about uh, someone who mentioned adjustment disorder and uh, having their symptoms being dismissed in, in, the, in the questions. Um, having a neuropsychiatric assessment or a neuropsychological assessment, uh, uh, again, not covered, unfortunately, by OHIP really put, puts the point on where the cognitive defic- deficiencies are coming from and helps, tar- and helps guide the, the treatment in, in the correct direction. Uh, the best uh, uh, person to help you with cognitive difficulties is an occupational therapist. They do have uh, means of um, memory, memory strategies, uh, planning and pacing strategies. Um, and those are uh, you know, uh, how these symptoms uh, become managed uh, over the course of the uh, recovery uh, period. But starting with a neuropsychiatric or a neuropsychological assessment, uh, because anxiety can cause cognitive difficulties, depression can cause cognitive difficulties, um, uh, ADHD can cause cognitive difficulties. So how much of the cognitive difficulties are coming from the concussion, how much of it is coming from the mental health perspective, it's very, very d- difficult to do without uh, formal cognitive uh, neuropsychological neuropsych- testing. Yeah, and I would just just add in terms of resources, because it is very difficult to, you know, to find that if, if, if you don't have insurance coverage, Toronto Rehab um, uh, has a tele-rehab center now, and uh, it's in Dr. Robin Green's lab, uh, and we run groups there, so cognitive behavioral therapy, goal management training, which can be helpful for cognitive difficulties, and these groups are actually free. Um, so, and they are open to individuals with concussions. So that, that may be another possible option for people out there. I'm just conscious of the time. Um, let's see, is it safe to get a CT scan for mild concussion? Dr. al Yes. Yeah. So, um, the, so when, whenever you have a head injury, we follow something called the Canadian concussion CT head rules. CT scans are, um, uh, uh, they, they induce radiation. So there's a radiation exposure with, with CT scans. So uh, if you Google Canadian CT head rules, uh, we try to find who, uh, which person would actually need the CT scan. The problem with the CT scan is it doesn't detect a concussion. We do the CT scans to 
uh, rule out alternative, alternative causes for your symptoms. So we're looking for a bleed, we're looking for a fracture, we're looking for a blood clot, we're looking for a stroke. So the, the CT scan will not diagnose a concussion. Is it safe? It depends on risk benefit. So if the risk of you having a more complex injury, uh, uh, then, uh, then it, it will outweigh the, the risk. Um, uh, whereas if, if your symptoms seem mild and you don't fit the Canadian CT head rules, then the risk of radiation outweighs the benefit that we would foresee from, from getting a CT scan. Great. Thank you very much. Rachel is asking about horseback riding. She's had a couple of concussions. She's asking, is horseback riding safe? So if there's no jumping, questioning whether a sitting trot or a canter is safe for the brain or should it be avoided? May I just I'll leave that to either of you. <laughs> Um, so, uh, in, in terms of, um, if you're recovering from a concussion, um, there's, there's a certain progression we would want to see before you're doing any jarring movements, like getting on horseback. So for example, we've, we've worked with, uh, the equestrian Canada on how to ease people back in. So that's certainly something to be considered while you're recovering, um, post recovery, uh, I'll allow, uh, Faraz to speak to that. So what I would say is that if you have rehabbed appropriately, uh, the uh, it, it's all of, everything is gradual gradual return. So if you if you've rehabbed properly, you've improved your core strength, you've improved improved your core neck strength, your symptoms have improved, then you follow the return to play guidelines, and the return to play guidelines are, um, are very well outlined on the parachute website. Uh, you um, you try it, um, uh, and if you don't have symptoms, then you can you can slowly increase it. Is it safe? Uh, if you're if you're a good rider, then then it's safe. And if your symptoms are controlled, then it's safe. Great, thank you. Uh, I know we're right at time, but I'm going to just try and squeeze in a couple more. What professional takes the role of case manager for TBI survivors, and how do you find one? I uh, <laughs> do you know, Leslie? <laughs> do I know? Yeah. I, it's, it's tough. I mean, I think it's, it again, you know, I, I'm, I think most familiar with case managers when you're talking about probably things like motor vehicle accident insurance or um, WSIB, but it, again, it's that whole funding issue, I think. Um, yeah. Um, I think uh, sometimes you have to have, especially with chronic concussions, you need to have a social worker on your side to advocate for you, a social worker with uh, good uh, knowledge in concussion uh, management and resources and connect you to the right services that you need. Uh, the case manager that you described largely depends on where the funding for your treatment is coming from. So if, if your injury was work-related or insurance-related, then your case manager would be the person who would be doling out the money. And every now and then they would need to have like um, an assessment by, uh, by a healthcare specialist to see whether or not you deserve more money. So, but having a, a social worker who has knowledge with, um, with concussions is, is important. Where you find them, um, I don't honestly know, but I think uh, TRI would have some good resources through their uh, rehabilitation program. I also really want to, um, rec can't recommend enough um, your, your local brain injury association, whether it's if you're located in Ontario, the Ontario Brain Injury Association, or you can check Brain Injury Canada for the associations across the country. Um, pe people tend to maybe not realize that they do, uh, that concussion does fall under their mandate and they offer more and more support services, uh, peer supports, things like that. And particularly with uh, helping people with uh, fi navigating financial pieces, healthcare pieces, um, that's typically where I refer everyone. Uh, uh, you know, apologies if, if You've tried that avenue and it hasn't worked for you, but that is something I highly recommend. I'm trying to answer some of the questions. Uh, I can see chapter. that. And yes, yes, the, uh, the questions keep coming. Um, but I think we're going to have to, um, I think we're going to have to close here shortly. Uh, can you stay for another minute or two? I can. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Can you? Okay. Uh, th this one, or do you want to answer the CTE question? I enough. see that you're typing. Yeah. So we have a question. Uh, how do you prevent CTE and, and CTB, CTE being chronic traumatic encephalopathy for those of you out there who aren't familiar? 
So it's hard. Uh, the problem with CTE is there really is no diagnosis. The only diagnosis we have for CTE is, is autopsy results. Um, so it's not seen on any imaging studies. It's a brain biopsy that diagnoses CTE as well as the conglomeration of symptoms. But the, the, the bottom line is um, uh, prevention is through avoiding the, uh, the, the successive subclinical hits to the head. Uh, those are what cause concussion. So if you've had one, two concussions, three concussions, maybe that's uh, through a sport, then maybe that's not the sport you should be playing. Um, for, for every day, for people who have, I mean, there are people who have seizures and every time they have a seizure, they hit their head. Uh, that those are hard. Do they do they develop CT? It's hard to tell. I'm not sure if they've they've actually done, and it's not really my area of expertise. And I'm not sure if they've done um, uh, any like brain biopsies on on those types of patients. But the the bottom line is avoiding uh, the repetitive uh, blows to the head through through sports or injury, if at all possible. There is no other prevention. Great. Thank you. Uh, Lori is asking, are spec scans helpful in diagnosing concussions or in looking at people who have had a concussion um, or concussion symptoms for a few years? Um, there, is, there is talk about it. Uh, I'm not sure if the evidence is conclusive yet. Um, so uh, I, I wouldn't be the, the, the proper person to ask about this because this kind of falls into the realm of the chronic uh, concussions. And uh, maybe this is best uh, directed towards a neurologist. Lori, uh, Stephanie, do you have any uh, have experience with this? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> You're muted, Leslie. Thank you. I was just looking, uh, I saw in the chat someone asking about uh, the Teller Rehab Center, so I was just looking for the link, and I just put it in the, uh, put it in the chat. Okay. All right. Well, I think uh, we've gone well over, so I just want to say thank you so much to both of you for presenting this evening. It was, uh, it was great, and thank you to all of you out there for all of the great questions. Um, just for those of you that have been here before, you know that we'll be sending you a, a short survey. We really appreciate hearing from you. If you have any suggestions, uh, comments, please uh, fill that out. It'll only take you a minute or two. Uh, and also, just to let you know, we're going to be back in two weeks uh, on Tuesday, April the 26th. And we're going to have Dr. Carmela Tartelia, a uh, neurologist, and she's going to be talking. Uh, her presentation is Concussion Mythology and Non Evidence Based Therapies. So thanks very much, everyone, and have a great evening.